In this video, we're going to talk about mineral resources. Clap if you care! Mineral resources can be divided into two major categories, metallic and non-metallic. Metallic resources are things like gold, silver, tin, and copper. Non-metallic resources are things like sand, talc, fluorite, and sulfur. But what are mineral resources? A mineral resource is a volume of rock enriched in one or more useful materials. The word mineral here can be any substance that comes from earth, such as sand, salt, and gemstone. So most minerals are processed. For example, iron. So iron is found in abundance in minerals. But the process of extracting iron from different minerals varies in cost depending on the mineral. It is least to extract from oxide minerals like hematite. Although iron occurs in other substances like pyroxene, the concentration here is less and the cost of extraction is increased because strong bands between iron, silicon, and oxygen must be broken. So they need more energy, therefore they need more resources. Because of extraction cost, labor cost, and energy cost varies from time to time and within country, the economic value of minerals differ. So in general, the higher the concentration of the substance, the more economical it is to mine. Wow, that was so powerful. <laughs> Academy Award. Thus, we define an ore as a body of material from which one or more valuable substances can be extracted economically. An ore deposit consists of ore minerals that contain valuable substance. Not all minerals, though, contain valuable substance. That's why we have this thing called as gang minerals. Huh? Gang minerals occur in the deposit but do not contain valuable substance. Basically, they are wastes. Different substances require different concentrations to be profitable, but the concentration that can be economically mined changes due to economic conditions. So we can determine the concentration necessary in mineral deposit for profitable mining. This is what we call the concentration factor. Now to get the concentration factor, we need to divide the economical concentration over the average crustal abundance. So aluminum which has an average crustal abundance of 8%, has a concentration factor of 4. This means that an economic deposit of aluminum must contain between 3 and 4 times the average crustal abundance. That is, between 24 and 33% aluminum to be economical. But the question is, where do these mineral resources come from? Like, what do you want me to say? Literally, what do you want me to say? Mineral deposits can be classified on the basis of the mechanism responsible for concentrating the valuable substance. We have five origins. Number one is the magmatic ore deposits, hydrothermal ore deposits, three sedimentary ore deposits, four placer ore deposits, and lastly, residual ore deposits. Magmatic ore deposits are substances concentrated within a body of igneous rock by magmatic processes like crystal fractionation and crystal setting. So these processes can concentrate ore minerals containing valuable substances by taking elements that were widely spread in low concentration and concentrating them in minerals that separate from the magma. For example, we have pegmatites. During fractional crystallization, Water and elements that do not enter the minerals are separated from the magma by crystallization. They will end up as the last residue of the original magma. This residue is rich in silica and water, so they will be injected into fractures surrounding the igneous intrusion and crystallizes as a rock. So they are now called the pegmatites. We also have the crystal settling. As minerals crystallize from a magma body, heavy minerals may sink to the bottom of the magma chamber. 
So heavy minerals such as chromite, olivine, and ilmenite contain high concentrations of chromium, titanium, and platinum. So these elements thus attain higher concentrations in the layers that form on the bottom of the magma chamber. So next we have the hydrothermal ore deposits. Hydrothermal ore deposits refer to concentration by hot aqueous fluids flowing through fractures and pores spaces in rocks. So the process will be the groundwater circulates to depth. Then it will be heated up. So it will heat up either by coming near a hot igneous body or by circulating along the geothermal gradient. This hot water can dissolve valuable substance throughout large volume of rock. As it moves into cooler areas, the dissolved substances are precipitated from the hot water solution. If the cooling takes place rapidly, then precipitation will take place over a limited area. This will result in a concentration of the substance attaining a higher value than was originally present in the rocks through which the water passed. <gasps> that was a lot! There are different types of hydrothermal ore deposits. We have the massive sulfide deposits, vein deposits, and another one. So a massive sulfide deposit occur at oceanic spreading centers. The hot fluids scavenge elements like sulfur, copper, and zinc. As these hot fluids migrate back toward the seafloor, they come in contact with cold groundwater. Therefore, it will precipitate. Now, vein deposits, on the other hand, happen surrounding igneous intrusions. So again, the hot water scavenge metals and silica from both the intrusions and the open fractures. They cool rapidly and precipitate mainly quartz, but they also give a variety of sulfide minerals and sometimes gold. So the last kind is the strata bound. The last kind is the strata bound or deposits. So they are found in a lake or oceanic sediment. So when Hot groundwater containing valuable materials enters the sediments. It will precipitate our minerals in the pore spaces. So this will give us lead, zinc, and copper. Next, we have the sedimentary ore deposits. So these are substances concentrated by chemical precipitation from lake or sea water. So the term sedimentary here is restricted to chemical sedimentation only. So this is where minerals containing valuable substances are precipitated directly out of water. So we have two kinds of sedimentary ore deposits. Number one is the evaporate deposits and the iron formations. So for evaporate deposits, this type of deposit typically occurs in a closed marine environment where evaporation is greater than water inflow. So as most of the water evaporates, the dissolved substances become more concentrated in the residual water and would eventually precipitate. Example is halite or salt. We also have gypsum and borax. For iron formation, these deposits are made up of repetitive thin layers of iron-rich chert and several other bearing minerals such as hematite. So it appear to be evaporate type deposits. They mostly formed in basins within continental crust. Next, we have the placer ore deposits. So placer ore deposits are deposits formed by the concentration of valuable substances through gravity separation during sedimentary processes. It is usually aided by flowing surface waters, either in streams or along coastlines. The concentration would be according to the specific gravity of the substance, wherein the heavy minerals are mechanically concentrated by water currents and the less dense particles remain suspended and are carried further downstream. So it usually involves heavy minerals that are resistant to transportation and weathering. Common deposits are gold and other heavy minerals such as platinum, diamond, and tin. The source rock for a placer deposit may become an important ore body if located. So this will be very important. So this is an example of a placer ore deposit formation. So the chemically resistant minerals 
weather from a vein deposit. It will move downhill by mass wasting and are concentrated by flowing water into stream placer. From there, you can collect the ore deposits. Next, we have the residual ore deposits. It is a type of deposit that results from the accumulation of valuable materials through chemical weathering process. So during the process, the volume of the original rock is greatly reduced by leaching. Leaching is the removal of soluble materials in rocks or our body through the percolation of water. So some important factors for the formation of residual deposit include parent rock composition, climate, Tropical and subtropical climates are favorable because they help in chemical decay. And relief. So it must not be high to allow accumulation. Common deposits are bauxites and nickeliferous laterites. So bauxites undergo intense chemical weathering brought by prolonged rains in the tropics. So this will leach the common elements that include silicon, sodium, and calcium through leaching. So this is an example of bauxite. So for the nickeliferous laterites or nickel laterites, these are residual ore deposits derived from the laterization of olivine-rich ultramafic rocks such as peridotite. Laterization is the conditions of weathering which leads to the removal of alkalis and silica. This will result in a soil or rock with high concentrations of iron and aluminum oxides. So, like in the formation of bauxite, the leaching of nickel-rich ultramafic rocks dissolves common elements, leaving the insoluble nickel, magnesium, and iron oxide mixed in the soil. In addition, an existing mineral deposit can be turned into a more highly concentrated mineral deposit by weathering in a process called secondary enrichment. So if a mineral undergoes secondary enrichment, you will produce a secondary ore deposit. Thanks everybody for coming out. I know y'all didn't expect me. Thank y'all so much, especially you in the back right now.